Hello and uh, welcome all to this Employment Law Masterclass. Um, my name is Harry Gurley and I work for Kaplan Financial. I'm based in the Southampton office. The objectives of this short tutorial video are going to be to talk to you about a bit of employment law during this masterclass. And what we're going to be looking at is how we distinguish in law between an employee and someone who is self-employed. We'll briefly look at a contract of employment and then one big area tested in the accounting law syllabuses tends to be the difference between wrongful and unfair dismissal. There are other areas tested such as redundancy. Um, we might briefly look at some remedies available um, but to be honest the distinguishment between an employee and someone who's self-employed and between wrongful and unfair dismissal. That is probably the area that gets tested most of all within employment law in accounting law uh, courses. Just before we get on with the material, I just want to play you guys a little video. The Supreme Court has ruled that a group of Uber drivers must be treated as workers rather than self-employed, a decision which means they could be entitled to a minimum wage and holiday pay. The decision marks the end of a five-year legal battle. It could have implications for many others. With more, here's our principal correspondent, Caroline Davis. Supreme Court unanimously dismissed Uber's appeal. Released after years of fighting. <laughs> Today, outside the Supreme Court, Yassin and James heard the decision they've been waiting for, that when driving for Uber, they were workers, not self-employed. I'm delighted to be honest. I, um, and, the, and I think this sends a strong signal to companies like Uber, these big massive companies, that, you know, the workers can fight them. They spend millions of pounds trying to beat workers. I mean, it's reprehensible that they've done this, but I'm just so delighted, thrilled and relieved. Worker status is not the same as an employee, but it means that they have the right to a minimum wage and holiday pay. The ride hailing app which connects drivers with passengers, Uber has always claimed it's an intermediary that was rejected by the Supreme Court. Uber say this judgment only applies to the drivers that first brought the case in 2016, not to every Uber driver in the country, because Uber say they've made changes since then. Some drivers and lawyers would disagree. Today, the court set out the reasons why it thought these Uber drivers were workers, which included the fact that Uber set the pay and the contract without any say from the drivers. How today's verdict will affect today's drivers and other workers will be the subject of future court cases. Other companies in the gig economy may already be working out what this might mean for them. They're going to have to look at their business model. If they think that they can continue with the self-employed model, um, it's quite clear that the judiciary isn't afraid to intervene into this to find that their self-employed um, individuals are actually workers. The court says that a driver is working from when they log into the app, not just when they have a passenger. Some drivers are worried that if Uber have to pay a minimum wage for those hours, they could cut down on drivers or change the way Uber operates. Okay. Um, so in terms of this case, it obviously reached its uh, conclusion after about a five-year legal battle uh, between Uber and the drivers. Um, I think it started in 2016, which is said in the video, and it reached its conclusion in February 2021. In terms of your law syllabus, what does it mean? Well, firstly, in, you know, after a five-year legal battle, Uber had uh, done uh, the final appeal to the Supreme Court after losing three earlier rounds in lower courts. Now, the fact that it reached the Supreme Court means that only if the Supreme Court or government bringing in some legislation 
is going to overrule and change the law moving forward. Remember, the Supreme Court is the highest court of the land. So any decision uh, made in the Supreme Court is the law unless legislation will overrule it. In terms of the actual decision, one thing that we'll see throughout this employment law masterclass in employment law studies is that whether someone is classified as an employee or self-employed will be on the balance of many factors. You're not going to look at just one or two factors. So in a way, this confirms the law. It also entitles the workers, the casual workers, to holiday pay and minimum wage. They are the rights of someone who is employed. And we'll talk a bit more about other rights as we go on through this little masterclass. The courts uh, decided that basically Uber were in a position of power over the worker. And that's one of the reasons why there was an employer-employee relationship. So it's a win-win for, I guess, for drivers, passengers and cities. Um, so let's have a little bit more about what might uh, lead to this distinguishment between employees and a self-employed individual. Um, so you tend to find that you've got two uh, types of working relationship. We don't really distinguish between a casual worker and employee here. Um, think of a casual worker as being an employee within uh, within your law studies. If you, It's a bit more complicated than that's in reality, uh, but for the purposes of your accounting law uh, syllabus, uh, think of as a casual worker as being an employee. Now, if you're an employee, you are basically going to be in service. You've got a contract of service, whereas someone who is self-employed has a contract for their services. There's going to be a number of tests that are going to be used to determine a worker's status. Um, one of the big things is the control test. So, for example, Kaplan, control me as an employee. They tell me where, when, and how they want me to do work. And, you know, anything that goes to me and Kaplan obviously has to be reasonable as well. They can't necessarily ask me to do something completely unreasonable, but I'm meant to comply with all reasonable requests uh, for how they want me to perform and where they want me to perform my work. Um, the integration test, someone is regarded as an employee if their work is integral, so part and parcel of the business. A good example here, if you think about an accounting firm, which I'm sure lots of you do, uh, do, 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 do work for an accounting firm. Now, if you're an auditor working for an accounting firm, if you're someone, uh, an accounts assistant producing sets of accounts, on a regular basis, or if you're someone doing tax returns, then you're going to be part and parcel of the business. Probably some admin support you're going to have as part and parcel of the business as well, and you're obviously going to have a management team and maybe some partners or some directors as well um, leading the team. These individuals, I mean, depending on the size, you might have other kind of um, support potentially as well but for, for most accounting firms you'd say these types of individuals are part and parcel of the business now for most accounting firms i would suggest individuals such as the window cleaner the plumber are probably going to be self-employed individuals as a pay or, or someone working outside of the business, they're not going to be regarded as an employee of the accounting firm. Possibly they might be an employee of the company they work for, possibly, but they're not going to be regarded as an, you wouldn't expect them to be regarded as an employee of the accounting firm 
they're working for. What we will see is that the court will take a lot of factors into account. And that's what it did during the Uber case, wasn't it? They took a load and load of factors. They're going to look at the overall position. Who has power in the relationship? Does the employer have the power, in which case the likely has been an employee, or does the individual have the power, in which they're not likely to be an employee? Now, looking at this, we're going to look at a lot of relevant factors, control obviously being one. Um, in terms of providing own equipment, a good example to think of that is maybe a laptop. You know. Are you provided a laptop by your employer? Um, so, laptop being provided would indicate an employee. But again, it's not just going to be one or two factors, it's going to be overall positioning. If you provide your own equipment, so providing your own tools indicates a self-employed individual. Um, now, if you've potentially got a situation where uh, you're free to hire your own, own helpers, so if you can hire a substitute, Um, then that indicates a self-employed individual. Whereas if it's kind of work you've kind of got to do yourself or within your team, that would indicate that you are probably going to be an employee. Uh, in terms of degree of financial risk, uh, set hours and salary. Indicates. An employee, if your financial risk, if you don't have a set hours, if you don't have. Uh, a set salary. That would indicate again, you are probably more in a, in a, in a, in a self-employed relationship. Uh, is there a regular method of payment, i.e. Uh, monthly backs? Employees would expect to be paid monthly. I'll su suggest as a minimum. And again, most of them in this day and age would get, you know, it would be bank transfer, wouldn't it, as opposed to maybe 20 years ago, 50 years ago, when a lot of a lot of individuals got paid via cash or check. Again, does the individual work regular hours? Regular hours would indicate probably more an employee relationship. Irregular would be more for self-employed individual. And the final thing, what do you mean by mutuality of obligations? Um, well, I, I guess what one employee would be after would, an employee, I guess, would be expected to be provided with work and an employer would be expected to provide the employee with work. Whereas with a sum of self-employed, there isn't that sort of uh, mutuality of, of obligations um, that are expected with each other and um, there's a few you know uh, i mean i mean uber is a big case that has kind of confirmed the law recently uh, but one other quite, quite big case was um in 1969 mark investigations limited versus the minister of social security and uh the the case was about essentially whether someone was an employee or whether they were self-employed independent contractor being somebody self-employed. And the facts were that market research were 
Jobs market researcher is working on a series of contracts following instructions issued by the company. The work had to be completed in a specified time, but the hours of work weren't necessarily defined, and she wasn't given any holiday or sick pay. Um, she was free to work for others if she wished. Does it in court made? What a court looked at is they looked at the overall picture. Now, the overall picture indicated there was some control over how the market research did her work. The terms of the contract were consistent with a contract of service. Remember, contract of service is an employee. She did not provide her own tools. She took no risk. That was all done by the employer. And so the majority of factors were indicating she was an employee. Um, if you're wondering why this case is important, uh, probably not something totally within your syllabus, but it does have relevance to tax law. And there is an overlap in employment law and tax law, because if you're an employee, um, the company you work for have to pay employers national insurance, as well as giving minimum wage uh, holiday pay, et cetera, et cetera, sick leave as specified in the above case. Um, so, yeah, one of the big things here in this case was that uh, on the market researcher, uh, the company had to pay uh, the government some employers' national insurance. I think you've also got pension contributions uh, uh, nowadays as well, don't you? So in terms of distinctions, probably more, again, probably one of these things a bit more important for your tax papers, but you know, the things on the page here can be tested as part of the law syllabus. Employees will get more statutory protection. We'll come on to a bit of unfair dismissal in a moment. There are implied terms in a contract of employment, both from the employer and the employee's perspective. An employer is vicariously liable for employees' acts whilst acting in the course of the employer's business. When a company becomes insolvent and becomes unable to pay their bills, an employee is higher up the creditor height. So they're far more likely to get the, the money that they're owed by the company to be repaid, either partially or in full, than someone who is an independent contractor and is not an employee. They would rank as an ordinary unsecured creditor um, and they're basically lower down the priority for repayment. Again, tax is going to be a big reason, a big differential. There can be tax in different ways. Employees paid monthly, usually via BATS, and have tax and national insurance deducted as they go along. Someone who's self employed tends to get taxed once a year. After a tax return, submit that through the trading income provisions, self-assessment tax return. And then, you know, you've got things like statutory sick pay, holiday leave, only available to employees. It's not available to someone who is self-employed. That's a big advantage, far more certainty and protection you have as a 
employed individual as opposed to a self-employed individual. Now, if we're assuming we're an employee, um, the rules of an employment contract to be a bit like any other employment contractual relationship that you might have seen in your contract law studies. So the rules of contract apply to your to your uh, relationship with your employer. Um, if you've got an employment contract, which uh, the vast majority of you will, um, potentially if you've done a bit of casual work in the past, you may not have had a formal written employment contract. You might have had it just agreed orally. So it can be uh, written or it can be oral. Um, but generally speaking, what you're going to have either orally agreed or in most case, vast majority of cases in writing are things like, I guess, your hours, your pay, uh, notice period, so pay first as your annual salary, any holiday allowance. You may even have um, a, a bit about some duties, perhaps, depending on how much detail that goes into. But they're probably going to be some of the main things uh, that you will have in terms of express terms that you'll tend to agree uh, between the employer and the employee. Now, a change in terms, generally speaking, will require consent of both parties unless legislation comes in to overrule the contracts. Um, so a good example of this, I guess, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, in, in, in kind of in, in the start of it, I guess you could say in, in, in 2020, a lot of individuals will have either gone on furlough or had all gone from maybe a five day working week to a three or four day working week. That may have only been a temporary measure for a few months. That would have had to be agreed by both parties. So it's probably the employer that suggested it, but you would have probably had to find that you have to give some kind of written consent um, to your employer that you agreed to the reduction in your hours or to going on to further. Um, Sometimes you might get a term in the contract that allows the employer the right to vary the terms of the contract. Uh, so you might have a mobility clause which allows the employer to change location of the uh, of the employment provided is reasonable. You also um, might get your annual inflationary pay rise, uh, which would be another example of varying the employer having a right to vary a term of the contract. Um, the statute says that you need to, uh, as an employer, provide the employee with written statement of particulars. Um, so things like the business's name, the worker's name, their job title, description, start date, how much often they'll get paid, hours of work, holiday entitlement, um, obligatory training, any other benefits, probation period, and they should do this, I think, within a couple of months is, 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 is the guidance uh, there, guys. Um, as well as the express terms we've just talked about, there are also going to be some terms implied by the courts. Um, firstly, if we look at the implied duties of the employee, they're expected to provide faithful service. So when you talk about duty of fidelity, you're really looking at trust, being honourable. Yeah. If an employee goes and works for another accountancy firm, 
a competing accountancy firm, let's say, for example, that could be an example of maybe breaching faithful service, going in direct competition to your employee, employer, would probably be an example of break, uh, breaking down a trust you have with your employer. You're expected to obey lawful and reasonable orders. So whilst your employer shouldn't ask you to do anything illegal, if they do ask you to do something reasonable, you probably have to have a good excuse uh, as to why you shouldn't do it. Having said that, you know, let's be honest, making one more one small mistake should never be enough to get you fired, but you are expected to do legal and reasonable requests. Um, you should act with reasonable care whilst performing your duty. As, as I was just saying, if you make one small mistake, that shouldn't justify dismissal unless it's gross negligence or violence. You should also reimburse the employer for any damages incurred as a result of negligence. So basically, if the employer is sued, uh, in theory, they can try to, they, they might be able to get uh, some money back from you if you have been negligent as an employee. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess did, did, did this uh, case, list of uh, one for advice, it's a bit of a bizarre case. Um, it, 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 it kind of gives an example of how you've got a duty to exercise reasonable care and skill. Uh, believe it or not, but a son ran over his father, who was another employee with a forklift truck. The employee was therefore liable in damages for breach of contract. He hadn't exercised reasonable care and skill. I think that's fair to say. Um, with this confidentiality thing, I always say to students, think ethics. Think about your ACA code of ethics, the duty of confidentiality. You shouldn't disclose trade secrets to a third party or misuse confidential information acquired in the course of your employment. Um, you've got a duty to give personal service, i.e. you should do it yourself rather than get somebody else to do the work for you, unless you've maybe got an implied permission by being a manager or supervisor to maybe delegate to somebody within your team. That's a different situation. But you're still accountable for the job that they do if you're going to delegate. You shouldn't get somebody else outside the organisation or in a completely different department that's got nothing to do with you to do your work for you. And again, we've got this mutual obligation and there needs to be respect and consideration for one another. Um, in terms of the employer, um, I often have a bit of debate with students about what reasonable remuneration means. And a lot of students will say, well, that means market wage, Harry. Uh, that's not quite true. Um, what we're really looking at here is minimum wage. Now, to be fair, if a company doesn't pay market value, they're probably not going to attract or retain high quality employees so that's why most firms will tend to pay most companies most businesses will tend to pay around um market value for an employee if they can afford it there'll probably be some other benefits on top but legally it is, it is basically a minimum living wage that companies are expected to pay. And it's up to them if they want to pay, if they can afford, if they feel they can afford 
to pay a high, high wage, medium wage, or slightly lower, I guess, than market value. Um, if you do some travel, um, then employers should indemnify employees for properly incurred expenses. So, for example, when I was in practice, I used to do some travel to a client. Uh, I used to go up to Scotland to do some site visits and audits and to the Channel Islands as well. I expected my firm, my employers, I expect them to uh, pay for a hotel accommodation, to pay for overnight meals, give me a, a subsistence allowance during the day, pay for my flights. I hired a car when I was up in Scotland. Uh, when I was on Channel Islands, I had to get some taxis around. Uh, quite a small island, isn't it? Channel Islands. They're not big islands. Um, so, yeah, I expect it to be uh, in, you know, for travel to clients, for example, you expect to be uh, indemnified and reimbursed for that. Um, you should comply with health and safety. Again, you've got duty of confidentiality. Um, that employers have for their employees. Um, one interesting one is they've got a, a, um, an obligation or a duty to provide some work, but technically the minimum they have to do is provide some training. You know, if someone's on a CPD qualification, such as ACCA or ICAW or SEMA, for example, um, then really the, the bare minimum is providing them with some training. And if they do this, technically, they could just you know, train the individual up. Obviously, they're not going to, the company's not going to be very successful if all they do is provide an employee with training rather than actually some practical work experience in the long run. In the short run, maybe, but in the medium to long term, unless you actually give your, uh, give your employees some proper work to do, um, they're probably not going to develop and be very profitable to the company in the future. Again, we've got this mutual cooperation, trust and confidence that should be between the employer and the employee. Um, one interesting one is about references. So there is no general duty to provide a reference. You don't have to provide one. Um, now, one key thing with this is if you do provide a reference as an employer, it must be truthful. I think nowadays, for this reason, a lot of companies will just get HR to state some facts about them, i.e. length of service, um, attendance record, for example, um, especially with employees that may be left in, in, in not the best way, um, then often um, companies will decide not to give a bad reference, even if it's truthful, just because they uh, risk being sued. The key thing is with a reference, they must stick to the facts. Um, there are some terms that um, statute will imply, um, such as unfair dismissal, which we'll come on to in a moment. Uh, working time regulations, um, Employment Act for children under the age of 18, giving parents the right to request some flexible working arrangements. In this case, when you've got children under the age of 18, employers should give serious consideration to a request and it can only be rejected for very clear business reasons. So for example, if uh, you were a someone who ran a bar as an employee, 
and uh, you said, oh, I can no longer work evenings or weekends, the pub would probably have a pretty clear business reason for saying, oh, no, we can't, uh, you know, we can't go ahead with this relationship. You know, if, if you're only saying you can work breakfast and lunch times as an employee working at a pub, that's probably not going to work from their point of view. It might do if they have a very busy lunchtime run, but it's probably most, uh, m most settings it's probably not going to work. Um, quite a common one nowadays, Equality Act of 2010 which protects people from discrimination in the workplace. And you've also got the Minimum Wage Act, which I think we've discussed a little bit already. Um, last thing I really want to discuss is in this masterclass is a few things about the difference between wrongful and unfair uh, dismissal. Um, so, Before we get on to uh, or on to detail to wrongful and unfair dismissal, there's a little bit on notice pits. We talked a bit earlier how these are often expressed terms stated in a contract of employment, either written or orally agreed. Or uh, written, it's obviously better, more evidence from the employees and the employer's perspective. However, one thing a lot of students don't realise is that legislation provides certain minimum periods in the employment contracts. So a lot of the time, you find students will say their contract gives them a notice period of four weeks or maybe one month. However, the legislation, Employment Rights Act of 1996, gives some minimum periods. For less than two years, they only need to give one week. That's a minimum. Okay. So, you know, then the contract would overrule the legislation and a contract of employment saying four weeks or one month notice period would overrule the legislation and that takes precedent. I guess the complication comes in this bit here once somebody has worked for a company for more than two years or so probably, probably more than four or five years to be fair because that once you've worked for a company for more than two years, you get a minimum of a week's notice each year of continuous employment. And so if you've got 12 years service, you should have a 12-week notice period. And that is regardless of the contract. That is what legislation says. And so if the company only gives you a month's notice, you have the right to some extra money. And you could technically uh, try to claim that extra money from your former employer. Um, no, it is a maximum of uh, 12 weeks. Um, it, I mean, a lot of people, you often do get, you know, notice periods. I think three months is a fairly common one. And that's probably because of the fact that, you know, if you've got a lot of long-term employees, then a lot of your employees are going to be entitled to this 12-week minimum notice, hence probably the, uh, the, the three-month notice period. And one thing, again, a lot of students don't know, is that technically an employee only has to give their employer one week notice if they want to leave their job. 
reason for this is that the law doesn't want to stipulate, doesn't want to enforce that employees work in conditions for an employer that they're not comfortable with. Um, obviously, the probably best advice is if you can stick to your notice period, it's going to make sure you, you know, have a better relationship with your former employer when you leave. Uh, and they might even give you a nice reference uh, if they do. Um, so it's probably best advice, uh, really, I would say, to, you know, try and stick to notice period if you can, um, for all sorts of reasons. I say it's going to give you a better, a better reputation when you leave uh, your former employer. But technically, it is minimum one week that you have to give your employer. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between unfair dismissal and wrongful dismissal. So we'll come on to wrongful dismissal in a moment. Wrongful dismissal is basically like breach of the employment contracts. Unfair dismissal is where an employer terminates a contract without a justifiable reason. In order to have a claim for unfair dismissal, you must be a qualifying employee. You must have two years of service. You also need to prove you've been dismissed. You must claim to an employment tribunal within three months of the termination of your employment. Dismissal could be your contract being terminated, expiry of fixed term contract, or constructive dismissal. Constructive dismissal is where an employee terminates a contract without notice by reason of the employer's conduct. It must be that there must be sufficient serious behaviour for the employee to leave at once. If you continue for any length of time without leaving, you may have been regarded as affirming or ratifying the contract. Um, so let's just say, for example, I live down in Southampton, just to the east of Southampton city centre, near, fairly near Southampton Airport. Um, let's just say I was asked to go and work for a long period of time, so, so maybe more than a week or so, maybe, maybe a few months, several months, up in Glasgow. Um, I might be happy to do that, quite possibly, especially if I'm going to be reimbursed. Or be given a nice, uh, nice bonus to do it, or some reward for doing it. However, it could be you've got a young family. It could be you're married. It could be being forced to work up in Glasgow. Is well, I mean. You, as, as we were saying earlier, you expect to comply with reasonable requests. But it might be it's just completely unfeasible for you to go and do that. In which case, if your employer forces you into that situation, you may have a claim for being constructively dismissed. It will be based upon the circumstances as to what is reasonable and what is unreasonable, and that will vary from case to case. But it could be that you feel you are being forced out. It gives a couple of examples in the notes of cases so one was about a pilot who was requested to take some abnormal risks on a flight and the employer asked him to do this 
three times in quick succession. Each time he refused, and the relationship deteriorated. Thus, the pilot resigned. A serious breach of contract was committed, and the employee succeeded in his claim for constructive dismissal. Again, there was an example, probably not too dissimilar to the one I was given a few moments ago about someone's terms terms of contracts being uh, being altered without their say so. You had somebody who worked on night shift, could have been for childcare reasons, maybe, or maybe it's preferred work at night. The employer tried to force him to start working on the day shift. He refused and he resigned. And he could be treated as being constructively dismissed as the employer's conduct had amounted to an attempt to unilaterally change an express term of the employment contract. Uh, in terms of automatically unfair reasons for dismissal, victimization of complainants or whistleblowers of health and safety would be unfair. Pregnancy or maternity leave rights, definitely unfair. Trade union membership, asserting a statutory right, such as minimum wage, annual leave, sick pay, unfair selection for redundancy. Potentially fair reasons for dismissal would be showing um, that the employer has acted reasonably. We'll have a look at a moment at some of the statutory fair reasons. And the employer has to show what the principal reason for dismissal was. It could be capability or qualifications. Now, this is a fair reason if the employee has been given the time the support to improve and they've had formal meetings in the past um, that have discussed the areas in which they are achieving their targets and objectives. And they've, they've been told and given clear guidance what they need to do to improve. So that's basically when you're not you not been particularly good at your job, but you've been given enough support and encouragement and time to improve. It could be a uh, conduct. Um, we've got a case here, Stevenson versus Golden Wonder, where there was an unprovoked assault on another employee at a social event held outside working hours in the company canteen. Um, redundancy would be a fair reason for dismissal. Um, often you'll end up with a, a compensatory package that can at times be very nice if you're made redundant, but obviously it can be very upsetting in other situations. It could be there's a bit of a change in some legislation, which means it's no longer uh, legally uh, possible for you to be allowed to, to work for the company. Or there could be some other substantial reason, such as um, someone being involved in some criminal dishonesty, for example. If, you know, when, it, when you look at unfair dismissal, it's often going to be on the basis of what is fair, the idea of equity. What are the merits of the case? Has the employer actually acted reasonably? And again, it's going to depend on all the circumstances and it will vary really from one case to another. Case law shows that a reason given has to be sufficiently serious to justify dismissal. Reasonable procedures must have been adopted by the employer when coming to decision to dismiss and the manner of the dismissal. 
So we've got some examples of what would not be considered reasonable, being dismissed without any warning, except maybe when you've committed some kind of gross, neg gross uh, violence or something like that. Not giving time for proven training consultation in areas of difficulty, if it's on the grounds of capability or qualifications. If you're going with ill health, there must be proper medical evidence and not fully investigating any complaints and also what the employee's point of view was. In terms of remedies for unfair dismissal, um, the main, well, you've got three ones really. You've got reinstatement, which is essentially your old job back without any break in continuity. The trouble with that is it's not usually very popular. Um, and if there's been a breakdown in a relationship, it's highly unlikely to happen. Having said that, if you are maybe in quite a specialist career, and he lived down the southwest of Cornwall or maybe northeast of Scotland in quite a remote location, northwest Wales, probably be another example of that. He might consider that sort of uh, re remedy because there aren't that many jobs within an hour or so's commute of those particular areas. But again, that has to be in line with the employee's wishes. Re-engagement would basically even be a new job role in the organisation, but maybe in a different department or working with different individuals. But again, there still has to be a bit of a relationship. There can't be a complete breakdown between the employer and the employee. Okay. And then you've got compensation, which is the most common award uh, due to usually due to breakdown of relationship basically damages. So it's a usual remedy due to the breakdown of relationship. Um, different types um, of award. Yeah, what you'll tend to find, guys, is that um, the award will depend on things like how long you've worked for your employer when you dismiss, how old you are, and uh, it, there'll be various factors taken into consideration. Um, there might be an additional uh, award if your employer has behaved poorly. Um, the final thing I just want to go through in this masterclass is what wrongful dismissal is in comparison to unfair dismissal. Wrongful dismissal is more when the employment contract has been breached. It's usually when wrong notice periods has been given. So insufficient notice has been given, employees lack two years service, that can often be, be a situation uh, where, where wrongful dismissal is claimed. So for example, if you've got a three month notice period, either via legislation or via employment contracts, but your employer only gives you one month notice, not three months. That is the most common type of wrongful dismissal. Uh, you might also claim it where the damages exceed the statutory maximum for unfair dismissal, potentially. If you're better off getting three months pay than claiming for unfair dismissal, you're better off doing going for maybe trying to go for wrongful dismissal, potentially. Um, also, we've got quite a narrow deadline for unfair dismissal. Uh, wrongful dismissal, the deadline is six years of the breach, whereas it was a much, much tighter deadline, if you remember, for the uh, unfair dismissal, uh, which you may remember. You have to bring a case within three months of the date of termination. But yeah, if, if not enough notice is provided, then you can claim wrongful dismissal 
instead. This uh, wrongful dismissal is a case that can be brought in the county or the high court. An employment tribunal would have jurisdiction if the claimant is an employee, is brought within three months of dismissal, and is for less than 25 grand. If, it's, if it doesn't meet that criteria of being within three months of dismissal and for less than 25 grand, they don't need to hit the county court or the high court. Okay. Okay, so as a kind of wrongful dismissal, it's all about breach of employment contracts. Um, it does sometimes happen when someone is dismissed without any notice. Um, but obviously, if uh, an employee misbehaves, then that is often going to be justified. And that's where you get something called summary dismissal. Um, summary dismissal is basically dismissal without any notice. Dismissal without any notice is going to be wrongful unless the employees committed a fundamental breach. They've accepted shorter notice and maybe payments in lieu of notice. So three months pay. Instead of working the notice period, you don't have to work your notice period if the employer just wants to pay you off. So some serious breaches of the contract to employment would be willful disobedience of lawful order, uh, gross misconduct, dishonesty, gross or persistent negligence, and uh, breaching an express term of the contract. And when you're looking at what is um, summary dismissal and whether it's reasonable, you're going to look at the standards of the ordinary everyday person again. Um, you'll also, one thing to note down the bottom here with summary dismissal, this will also occur if a sole trade or partner passes away, where an employing partnership is wound up or dissolved, or where a company is liquidated. So guys, that brings us uh, to the end of our employment law masterclass. Hopefully, you're a bit clearer now with what the difference is between the employee and the self-employed independent contractor and some of the ideas um, as to what in law will form the differences between that type of working relationship. And hopefully, you're again a bit more familiar with wrongful dismissal, which is essentially breaching employment contracts. And unfair dismissal, which is where there is no justifiable reason for determination. Obviously, we've only scratched the surface of employment law. There's a lot of other things. Um, you know, redundancy is another big one that we haven't touched on today. Okay. There's a lot of things to consider, but hopefully we've given you a flavour for some of the ideas to help you with your um, account or your employment law in your accounting studies. All the best, and thank you very much for listening to this employment law masterclass. My name is Harry Gill. All the best now. Take care. Bye-bye.